Okay, so you're looking for a dojo. Maybe you've already found one. Maybe you've even been training there for a while. But is this dojo a safe place for you? Hey, what's up? I'm Ken. This is Kenfu TV, and you're watching Ken Learns Ken Fu, the part where I reflect on my training as I take in different feelings and opinions on stuff. As I continue to train myself, uh, I reflect on the things that I'm learning and, and starting to identify with as I go. So these are my opinions. These are the things that I'm thinking about. These are the things that I'm working through, and they maybe even changed at some point. And they certainly have probably changed already from where they started. That said, each week I release videos in the martial arts, philosophy, training, technique, that kind of thing. If you're new here, welcome. Glad to have you. If you like this sort of thing, be sure to subscribe. Every Monday I do these Ken Learns Ken Fu videos, but I do other videos throughout the week, so be sure to hit that bell so you know when those come out, because they're a little less consistent. But let's jump into it. Is your dojo a safe place? What does that even mean? What am I even talking about? I wanna tackle it from a couple different angles because I think there's multiple pieces to this puzzle. You know, for starters, I hope that if you're getting hurt all the time, you go in and you just get hurt day one, and that pattern continues, that you know that that's just not a good place and you should go. Right? That's not exactly what I'm talking about. Instead, I'm talking about the philosophy of training. I believe firmly that you should follow a progression of danger. You know, you start with little to no danger, and you work up to significantly more danger, but you work up to it. A way to look at this progression of danger is to not look at it as a progression at all. Instead, the idea of the level of danger being the same all the time through your training. I think this is going to be the best way to approach it. While we talk about this, I'll also talk about some places that I think can be really bad and places you don't want to train or things that could, could end up in a really bad situation. Truly, I find them scary. We'll get to that later in the video. So what do I mean when I say that there should be a progression of danger, but your training should, the danger level of your training should stay the same? So what do I mean when I say there should be a progression of danger, but then the danger level of your training should stay the same. That seems kind of contradictory. Here's what I mean. When you walk in off the street, you've got a certain level of competence, which might be a zero level of competence, or it could be higher than that. When you begin your training, that should be taken into consideration. You should start with some basics, get some ideas, right? I mean, if you're starting a new style, a new system, the first thing that should happen is, is just some feet wet. Hey, this is how we do stuff. These are the techniques we use. These are the, the basics. Not really any danger in that. Okay, so there's that first kind of, I'll call it the orientation period, where there isn't really any danger at all. You're just starting to get used to the idea of training. Okay, here's your basic blocks or punches or strikes or kicks or whatever it is. Depends on the art as what you're going to be exposed to at that stage. Once you start working past that, though, there needs to be a little escalation, right? You should be working with a partner. You know, you should be working with other people and having to use skills against another person. That's an important step. And really, that's what your training should be like. If you don't have interaction with other people, then how do you ever expect to develop the ability to work against other people who don't have your best interest in mind? Now, people come into the dojo for a lot of different reasons. Plenty of people think, well, you come into the dojo to learn how to fight. Okay, I think there's a lot of people who think that. I also, after years of being in the dojo, and now years of running a dojo, I'd say it's also the smallest amount. It's not the main reason. Here's the things that I see, right? I see people come in looking for confidence. Not confidently to be able to, to beat somebody up, but just they don't have any. It's very low and they need to improve it. That's definitely there. I see people who've been through something. Well, they might be approaching it from the idea of, how do I make sure that this never happens again? I think there's a part of them that's also looking for how do I recover from what's already happened to me? How do I put myself in a place where I can feel safe and, and feel like I'm gaining skills, but also surrounding myself with people that I can trust and, and hope to heal through this process? There's also people that are just looking for fitness. I want to lose weight. I want to get in better shape. And, and I've heard that martial arts is a great way to, to do that. It is, by the way. It is. It's not enough. Truly, I don't... I don't I don't think that it is. If, if you're training in art where there's a lot of information, then the, your heart rate's not up the whole time. You're not running that stuff. I mean, there is something about having a conditioning class for conditioning. Okay, so don't, don't get the two things confused. Now, some, some gyms, some dojos are going to put those two together. They're going to have a strong conditioning base and a strong base in, in the martial art itself. And those things are going to tie together. And as you go further and you spar more and you roll more and you do all that kind of stuff, then that idea of whole body conditioning becomes there. You will gain strength 
I can laughingly say that a lot of people gain gain a lot of strength in their legs when they do karate and then they have to go buy new pants because their pants don't fit right anymore. You, know, you gain strength. That doesn't necessarily mean you lose weight. So, so keep that in mind. But it is a good place, right? Because at the end of the day, whether it be your training or, or your fitness, you're going to do the thing that you like the most, right? If you absolutely hate going to the gym and it's a struggle to do it every time, it's not sustainable. You won't do it forever going to fall down. But if you love going to the dojo, maybe you don't get the same impact. And maybe this should be a whole different video, but maybe you don't get the same impact in your overall conditioning. But you do it two, three, four times a week because you like it. Well, two, three, four times a week of, of a lower level of conditioning regularly beats going one time a week and hating everything about it and working really hard and then not doing it again for another week. You do what you like. You're going to invest time in the things that you like. So keep that in mind. So, so, so far I have not mentioned a whole bunch of people who are actively there to fight and learn how to kill people or maim people or beat people up. It's not, that's not there. There are those people. Uh, it's few and far between, truly, at least. I've seen a lot of people come through our doors and I don't see that happen a lot. I really, really don't. But let's not get it twisted. It's really important to realize that people do still have it in the back of their head. Even if they showed up to get in better shape or they showed up to get more confidence at least part of them is going i'm also learning to protect myself and that's important you cannot discount the idea that someone is viewing this stuff as something that's going to protect them it's going to protect them and the people that they love whether they say it out loud or not they think that it's got to be addressed if you're running a school you need to be paying attention to the fact that if you're not doing something to to help that here's the thing about assumptions if people make the assumption that they're getting that thing and they believe that, just in my experience. They're not likely to tell you that that's the thing. They just, they believe it. They believe it's true. They believe that you believe that. And it doesn't need talked about. So just because they're not saying it doesn't mean that they're not expecting that that's the result that they're getting. So don't set them up for failure. That would be terrible. They'd end up in a situation thinking they can do more than they can and they can't. Okay, but so let's circle back. So there needs to be a level of interaction with another person. There needs to be training and and focus on actual interaction looking at modern practices of things like yoga and, and modern tai chi and things like that there's not an interaction with other people and if you look at some karate styles like kono styles things like that there could even be a lot of focus on forms and not a lot of focus on interacting with each other and that can be very dangerous because you're not actually developing a skill that you're learning how to apply to another person you may be developing skill, and you could, should be getting side benefits from that. Flexibility, mobility, strength, etc. But nothing replaces the fact that violent interaction is scary. And there's a level of conditioning. If you want to be able to keep your cool and keep your head on straight to be able to make it from one side to the other, you've got to be able to make it past that panic. And the only way you make it past that panic is by conditioning. Conditioning the idea of that panic conditioning the idea of that fear. So you got to work with each other, right? If it's scary having somebody throw a punch at you, then you need to do it more until it's not scary. When it's not scary, there's more things that you can do. So you start off your training with interaction with each other, hopefully, and you continue to work technique. Now that technique and the stuff that you're doing should be happening at a range that gives you the best opportunity. Okay, so when I first started karate, that was around the idea of being further away. I want to maintain distance. If you move, I want to continue to take an angle or move away in a way that keeps that distance, lets me strike you while staying out of your range. Okay, so that's that's a safe place. You can't only ever train that because fights don't go that way. Violence doesn't go that way. But it's a great place to start. Okay, and the weapons-based arts, Filipino martial arts and the kabuto and different stuff that I've done, same thing. Starting further away where I'm outside of your ability to touch me Ideally, staying out there as best I can while figuring out how to leverage my ability to touch you and keep myself safe at the same time. That's a great, safe place to start. Okay, so I was just working on this edit and realized I did not mention the other things. So I talked about long range, being outside of someone's range, um, and then working in closer where it's more dangerous. But the opposite is also true, and I forgot to mention that. So you also have being in tight in someone's range, being in the clinch or, or where you're actually controlling limbs or you can feel, right? So you move from a long distance where you can see what's going on and you can maintain distance. And then you also have some systems are going to start tight enough that you can that you can 
feel the danger. You can feel when someone's trying to hit you or, or move or something like that. And so then for them, the danger is as you start moving further back and you create more opportunities for someone to hit you or strike you, where you start having to bring back in that vision, it becomes different. So I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to mention that it's not just long range. Long range is not the only safe place. Um, it just depends on the art that you're training. So we've established a danger level, a level of danger in which I could get hurt, but if I practice and, and we slowly build this up, I will get better and I won't get hurt. And then they can ratchet up a little bit further, you know, move a little faster, come in a little harder, get a little closer, and I can manage that now. I've worked through it enough that I've gained enough comfort at a lower level that I can go up. Now, and that's what I mean, right? So that danger level is now starting to rise, but my skill level is rising too. So we're okay. It should be noted that my skill level and my danger level should not be equal. If these are equal, then I'm not challenged and I'm not going to grow. My danger level needs to be higher, not higher, but higher. So as I get into here, then this continues to rise, but it has to stay ahead. It has to stay ahead to continue to challenge me, to continue to stretch me and get me to grow outside of where I am now. As that continues to happen, this danger level will rise, but my skill level will also rise. And so it stays fairly even, not even, even if you get my drift, but then you look back, okay, I've been training three months, six months, nine months, year, two years, three years. The things that you're capable of, the things that you're able to do, the areas where you feel confident and you feel safe and you can work without failure every time, right? If someone were to do that technique or whatever, they, they're attacking you, you're sparring, whatever it is, and you're able to maintain safety, not get hurt, well, that level's higher. You're doing things that you never would have been able to do day one, but you can do them now. That's exactly how I feel that it should go. That will lead you to success. And it should continue that way. It should always continue that way. It should never stop. So let's talk about the two main areas that I see failure. Places that I would qualify as dangerous places do not train here. The first, tough schools. Okay, so the idea of a place that, you know, reality is scary, violence is scary, you need to be protected. Okay, usually that comes with a level of induced panic. Not necessarily a great way to start. I'm not saying that you shouldn't respect the reality, but you also shouldn't generate fear faster than you generate confidence. Because when you do, then people are just afraid and then they shut down. That's not a way to make someone safe. It's also a good way to make someone paranoid where everything looks like the enemy and they can't live a, a good life. But then the training can be hard. That's when injury happens. When people are training really hard, they're attacking really hard, they're doing things that you're just not ready for. And that's not to say that you can't get there, but you're just not ready yet. And injuries happen. People get hurt. That's not safe. It's not conducive and it's certainly not sustainable. And I would argue that it builds a really bad mental space. And then let's go to the far end, the other extreme, places where you come in and you learn. And maybe you even started off with what I just what I described before, where there's that escalation of danger. But then it tops out. And you continue to train and you just feel untouchable. And then you go train people up to that level and you just continue to go and, and people just don't push you. Your training becomes more about learning the next form or, or just practicing technique and things that are just kept within this safe bubble. As a side note, I, I was watching an Andy Allen video, which if you haven't watched his stuff, uh, I'll link it below because you should. Really, really good. Uh, but it said, flashed up on the screen, don't be a bubble wrap black belt. And I really like that because it's, it's accurate. So it falls right into line with what I'm talking about. If you are training in a way where you feel confident, you feel good, but you're never tested, then the, the challenge is gone. You will become complacent. You'll, you'll lose your ability to be good at this stuff. And you will generate people who feel the same way. Even if they're your peers and you're not necessarily teaching them, it will happen because as a training partner, it's your job to help provide that resistance and hope that that partner is also providing you resistance so that you guys can continue to do this and work up, right? It's my job to create a situation where you need to protect yourself. It's your job to be able to protect yourself. And if we both do those jobs well, then we will learn and we will improve and our skill will go up. 
I see this a lot when I see things like really young black belts and stuff like that. A lot of the places that allow for really young black belts also allow for their their material to just not rise. It becomes more about can you do these drills? Can you you know do these techniques? Can you kick really high? Can you do these forms, these complicated things? And there's value in that from a coordination standpoint, from a fitness and, and flexibility, mobility, all that kind of stuff. There's value in those things, but don't ever get it twisted that that's not protecting you from danger. Instead, it's just instilling this false confidence that you're way more capable than you are. And then as soon as you're challenged, you go, well, that's just not, you went too hard. You didn't have control. You didn't do these things. I believe training should be safe. I believe that that you should have some measure of control and that kind of thing when you're training, but there comes a point where if it's within a certain measure, you don't stop and tell someone, hey, you're being too rough. You need to realize that there's more to it than that, and you need to raise your skill level. And if your skill level never rises, if you're in a place that will never push you past that skill level, you're probably in the wrong place. And you can love those people, you can want to be around them, you can do that, but it doesn't mean that you're safe. It's generating a place of, of false security. And so just be careful. Be careful where you train. Make sure that you understand it. I, you know, I don't even care if you train in a place like either one of those places, but, but you get it. You know what the deficiencies are and you, you're okay with it and you're maybe even compensating for it somewhere else. That's great. I'm not saying those places should, I'm not telling you what to do. What I am saying is I want you to know about it. I don't ever want you to be in a place where where your understanding of your safety, your security, your confidence, your skill is a lie. Because when that's the case, that's when you get hurt. And sometimes you don't get hurt. Sometimes you continue to pass that on to the next person and the next person doesn't understand any better than you did and arguably less because that's how passing things on goes. And now they're in a place of, of lack of safety. It's just not a good place to be. So when you structure your training or you look at the training that you're doing, I'm not saying this is the only way, but I'll give you an example of, of how my instructor put it to me. Like when we would spar or when we would do stuff, he'd say, I'm going to be just 10% above where you are. That's my goal. It's just ride about 10% above where you are. Didn't mean that was his capability. It just meant he was going to bring his, his skill down to 10% above mine so that as I continued to work, as I started to close that gap... We got some good things, and my, my success rate started going much, much higher. Then you go, okay, we're ready to ratchet this back up. And he'd work back up to 10% above where I am now. And then just continue to do that, which means as I continue to rise, he continues to rise, and just continue to add that pressure, not leaving me stagnant to where I'm suddenly just winning all the time, and I just feel great, and I'm unbeatable, but also not being 100% better than me. And, and instructor's really good. And I've trained with a lot of people who are really good. That could just wipe the floor with me, especially at early parts of my training. If they had done that, I never would have learned anything. You need that that learning space, that zone of learning, and it has to be there. So maybe your percentages are different, maybe your method is different, but this idea of just 10% above where you're at, take whatever is safe for you, I'm going to add 10% so that you're not stagnant, so that you are growing, you are being challenged, and we're going to continue to move forward, and then we're going to continue to raise that as time goes on. That's perfect. It's perfect. It works great. And it will help you get there, right? But when your skill level is above your training, if you go and practice and you practice constantly with things that are lower than you, you will never grow. They will. That's great. You won't. If it's even, there's benefit. Like, you will grow. It's minimal. Like, it's going to be really restricted, really limited. You need somebody who's going to push you and challenge you. A really good friend of mine, Sean Stark, running an amazing program, I'll link it down below too, about uh, self-protection. And one of the goals of his program is to be able to deploy skills to people rapidly. They're in situations where they're not going to be d dedicating the next 10 years of their life to training. So he needs to get them something usable right away. And we've had a lot of talks about it and I've trained with him on it. Even in that case where it's like, okay, we're jumping kind of straight in. Even in that, there's there's an escalation. Okay, first, can you can you manage somebody coming at you? Can you can you cover your head? Can you can you do this stuff? Can you get comfortable with the idea? 
Okay, you're starting to get comfortable. Are you comfortable enough that now you can start deploying maybe your own strike or you can keep someone off of you with your feet or something like that? And just this escalation that has to happen. And it's that same idea. It looks different, right? Because it's compressed for time. So it has to be more real, more now, but it still has that progression. Depends on the art, depends on the goals, depends on everything as to what that progression should look like, but it needs to be in a progression and hopefully one that never actually ends. We're incredible beings. Humans are incredible. Our ability is untold. The only thing that stops us, the only thing that limits us is when we create a limit or we just stop. If we continue to push, we will continue to grow, period. That's what happens. So that's it. That's my thoughts on training and at least what that should look like, especially from whether or not you're actually preparing someone the right way. What do you think? How was your training? And what's that like for you? Hit, hit the comments and tell me kind of what that's like. And if you feel that that felt that way, are you in a place that matches one of those other categories where maybe this isn't the right place? You know, talk about that too. Anyway, in the meantime... Again, if you like this, hit that like. If you're new here and want to subscribe, do that. And we'll do more videos like this. Hit that bell so you know when some of the other can shares, can food, things, can likes, that kind of stuff comes out. And I'll catch you in the next one.